the Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Ambassador Series. My name is Paul Palazzolo, your Sangamon County Auditor and a volunteer for WSCC, and I'll be serving as your host for today's program. This program is a presentation of WSCC TV in cooperation with the University of Illinois Springfield. The television portion of the program is sponsored in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of the viewers of WSCC TV. It will be broadcast by WSCC and other PBS stations throughout the state. We encourage you to support WSCC TV Springfield so that they can continue to bring you programs like this and others that educate, inspire, and entertain. Now please allow me to introduce our head table to you. To my right and your left is Dr. Jerry Grubel, President and CEO of WSCC Television. To your right is our honored guest, Her Excellency Tracy Ann Jacobson, and seated next to her is David Racine, the Interim Executive Director for the Center for State Policy and Leadership at UIS. Now it's my honor to bring you our honored guest today. Tracy Ann Jacobson is the Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute. A career member of the Senior Foreign Service, Ambassador Jacobson previously served as the Dean of the School of Professional and Area Studies at the Foreign Service Institute from August 2009 to July of 2010. She served as the U.S. Ambassador to, J to Tajikistan from 2006 to 2009 and Turkmenistan from 2003 to 2006. She has also served as the Deputy Executive Secretary at the National Security Council at the White House. Her other overseas assignments have included Seoul, South Korea, Nassau, Bahamas, and Moscow, Russia. Ambassador Jacobson received her Bachelor of Arts from Johns Hopkins University and her Master of Arts from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She has received several State Department Meritorious and Superior Honor Awards, as well as a Presidential Meritorious Service Award. She has studied French, Russian, Spanish, Korean, and Tajiki. Please welcome Ambassador Tracy Ann Jacobson. Ambassador. Well, thank you. I want to thank all the people at WSEC for inviting me here to Springfield today, and thanks to all of you for coming out. It's a great pleasure for me to be here in the heartland of America. You know, when I heard I was going to be making a speech in Springfield, I went on Facebook and asked my friends for advice, and they said, try a horseshoe. <laughs> it didn't help me with my remarks very much, but I'll, I'll do my best. So it's been a privilege to represent you in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan as your U.S. Ambassador. And I look forward to sharing with you what our U.S. Embassies did there to advance U.S. interests. But I'm also happy to be here as a member of the Foreign Service. I'm one of 6,000 Americans who are charged with creating and implementing U.S. foreign policy both at the Department of State in Washington and at 265 posts in 180 countries all around the world. In order to maximize time for questions, I'd like to combine those two topics. I hope that by talking about the work of our embassies in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, I can give you a flavor of the work of the Foreign Service overseas. But first, since this is the Ambassador Series, I have a few statistics for you. Overseas now, we have 161 U.S. Ambassadors. Of these, 111 are career Foreign Service officers like me, and 50 come from outside the State Department. 48 are women and five hail from the great state of Illinois. People sometimes ask me, what does an ambassador do every day? The most important answer to the question is the ambassador serves as the president's representative to the government and people of the country of assignment. But the ambassador is also the leader of a team. 
An ambassador is sort of a CEO of an interagency country team which is charged with implementing U.S. foreign policy. And the ambassador has to keep everyone on the same page, regardless of their agency affiliation, in achieving overarching mission goals. Sometimes people think that the ambassador is the senior representative of the State Department, but that's not really true. In fact, in accordance with a letter that every ambassador gets from the president, the ambassador is responsible for and has authority over all U.S. government personnel in a country and all U.S. government programs. The only exception is uniformed military personnel under the command of a regional combatant commander, but even in those cases, the combatant commander and the ambassador cooperate very closely. In my missions overseas in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, I worked not only with colleagues from the Department of State, but also Department of Defense, Justice, USAID, and Peace Corps, and we also ran programs and welcomed visitors from other agencies like Commerce and Agriculture. So why do we have an ambassador and embassies in places like Turkmenistan and Tajikistan? What is the U.S. angle in Central Asia? A lot of people think these countries are important to U.S. interests because three of the five stands have borders with Afghanistan. And it's certainly true that that is very important, but the real situation is much more complex. Tajikistan and Turkmenistan are republics of the former Soviet republics, and they've been independent now. Both are celebrating uh, 20 years of independence in what is really a very rough neighborhood. Turkmenistan has a southern border with Iran in addition to Afghanistan. It sits atop the world's fourth largest gas reserves. Its pipeline infrastructure goes to Russia and a little bit to Iran and China, but really needs to be diversified. Tajikistan, in contrast, is one of the poorest countries in the world. Its uh, indicators, for example, in child mortality are among the worst in the world and rival those of sub-Saharan Africa. It's the second most mountainous country in the world, but it lacks petrochemical resources, and its hydropower potential is largely untapped. Both countries face serious challenges in terms of trafficking in persons and trafficking in narcotics. Tajikistan seizes more Afghan poppy than the other four countries of Central Asia combined, and even that is a drop in the bucket. Both countries are led by highly authoritarian rulers. Corruption prevents economic development from growing the way it needs to. The history and culture of these countries is absolutely fascinating, and I have to say I've never experienced warmer hospitality anywhere in the world. But of course, my visit to Springfield is just getting started. <laughs> So let me tell you about what our mission goals were in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan and how they related to U.S. foreign policy. First of all, we promoted democracy and human rights. And this is not just because these are universal values, although we do believe that the desire for freedom exists everywhere in the world. It's really because we know that democracies, where people have an opportunity to participate in deciding their future, where they have a voice in government, are inherently more stable than authoritarian countries. And you only need to look at the news to see this happening, uh, particularly in the Middle East right now. Countries that are not democratic are more likely to erupt in violent conflict and to create problems that threaten US security interests around the world. Now, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, as I mentioned, are highly authoritarian. So how did we promote democracy and human rights in places like that? First of all, we have to deal directly with the senior levels of the host government. In Turkmenistan, that was President Niyazov, who called himself Turkmenbashi the Great, the father of all the Turkmen. He usually ran about number eight on Parade Magazine's annual list of worst dictators. He had written a book called the Ruknama, the Book of the Soul, which was not only required reading for everybody, but the main textbook for every course in every school. And if you wanted a license to drive or get married, you had to pass a Ruknama test. He had a golden statue on a giant pedestal in the middle of town that rotated to face the sun. Some people said the sun knew where it needed to be. <laughs> when you're dealing with somebody like this as your principal interlocutor, it's hard to find levers of influence, but we were able to do so. Beyond the host government, however, we dealt with local governments, civil society, activists, religious leaders, students, we tried to help them build their capacity to raise their voice for change because democracy can't be imposed from above, but it can always use a helping hand. 
It was important in both of my missions that we engaged regularly with other bilateral missions and with organizations such as the United Nations or Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe so that we could give a consistent message. If it's just the United States, we don't always have the same impact as when we're delivering a message in partnership with others. Our second major goal was economic development. Again, this is in the U.S. interest and not just in terms of trade and markets. Lack of economic opportunity creates a fertile recruiting ground for drug traffickers and terrorists. So we worked with host governments to improve the process by which businesses were able to register and operate. We tried to reduce the layers of bureaucracy and the number of government agencies involved, uh, which the World Bank euphemistically calls opportunities for rent seeking. We work directly with entrepreneurs to help them learn how to do business plans, seek financing, and find American partners. We brought them together. Sometimes people in the same business had never had an opportunity to sit down together and talk, share best practices, or lobby their government together. In Tajikistan, we created the first ever U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Tajikistan, and the only one that I know of where all the meetings are conducted in Russian, because most everybody doesn't speak English. To understand economic development in Central Asia, you really have to understand the nexus of water and energy. The downstream countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, have lots of petrochemical resources, but they don't have enough water for irrigation of their crops in the summertime. The upstream countries, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, have mountains and rivers, but not much in the way of gas and oil. Now, in Soviet times, all of this was controlled from Moscow. The downstream countries would provide heat and electricity to the upstream countries in the wintertime when the upstream countries' hydropower potential was frozen. And in return, the upstream countries would provide water to the downstream countries for irrigation during the summertime. With the fall of the Soviet Union 20 years ago, that system went away. And now, the downstream countries expect to be paid for their energy, but they expect to get the water from the upstream countries for free. We can't underestimate the personal animosities that also exist in the region that complicate this issue. For example, the Uzbek president is firmly against Tajikistan's development of a major hydroelectric dam at a place called Rogun. This dam was conceived in Soviet times, and if built according to those specifications, would be the highest dam in the world. The Uzbeks feel that if the Tajiks control that much water, they're going to use that control for political purposes. The Tajiks feel that the Uzbeks want to keep them weak and dependent on energy from Uzbekistan. And this goes back in history even to Stalin's time. Stalin drew the lines of the former Soviet Union according to sort of a divide and rule mentality by which uh, he put the major historic Tajiki or Persian cities of Samarkand and Bukhara, maybe you've heard of them, on the Great Silk Road. Well, he put those in Uzbekistan. People still speak Tajiki there to this day, and it causes, uh, it causes problems, so we can't underestimate. Uh, when you're talking about authoritarian governments, the power of personality has a big impact. Uh, since we are interested in the United States in energy independence and energy around the world, it's important for us to be able to follow these issues, to understand them, so that we can better agitate for U.S. access uh, to some of the big projects that are going on, and I'd be happy to talk about those if you're interested in the question and answer period. Our third major goal was security cooperation. This is the one pe people probably think about the most when they think about Central Asia. This was particularly important after September uh, 2001, and our main goal really is to keep the Central Asians on board with our efforts in Afghanistan. For example, when I was in Tajikistan, we negotiated an agreement on a northern distribution network that would allow the transit of our materiel to Afghanistan. And you may know that almost all the U.S. troops in Afghanistan go through a transit center at Manas in Kyrgyzstan. But our security cooperation goes deeper than this. We really want to help the governments of the region develop their capacity to fight narcotics trafficking, trafficking in persons, and other uh, kinds of crime. So we worked with police, other law enforcement, justice agencies, and the military to build their capacity. We built training facilities, we helped them develop curriculum, and one of the most important things that we helped to do was to get them to talk to each other. We found in both Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, sometimes, for example, the border guards 
didn't trust, didn't want to talk to customs. Law enforcement agencies not sharing information. Can you imagine? <laughs> One of the most important successes that we had in Tajikistan was getting the border guards to train together with their Afghan colleagues in a facility that we provided and using a curriculum that we had developed. And it was an effort to get the two sides to overcome some mutual suspicion. We can't forget that that thousand kilometer border Tajikistan has with Afghanistan used to be the border of the Soviet Union. But we got them working together and we got the government of Tajikistan to see they could play an even bigger role in promoting Afghanistan's security. So those were my mission's primary strategic goals, promoting democracy and human rights, economic development and security cooperation. And I haven't listed them in any particular order other than maybe alphabetical because they're all interrelated, they're all equally important. They're sort of like three legs of the same stool. We also had three goals that I think of as supporting goals. Uh, not an ends in themselves, but a means to achieve the first three. So these were what we call investing in people, mutual understanding, and diplomatic platform. Investing in people, we're mainly talking about investing in health and education. Uh, in both countries where I served, the health and education systems suffered from massive brain drain after the fall of the Soviet Union, and they were really not in great shape. And we can't achieve our main goals, democracy, governance, uh, economic development, security, if people don't have access to basic health care and education. In terms of health, we need partnerships around the world if we're going to fight pandemic disease like malaria, HIV, tuberculosis. In terms of education, uh, we know that lack of educational opportunities also create a fertile recruiting ground for the bad guys. For health, we invested a lot in retraining of doctors to be good diagnosticians and family medicine practitioners. And this was a switch from the Soviet times, which was really a system of specialists. And when you were ill, you would go to see a series of specialists and they would all uh, treat you. And, and it might take a while before you figured out what was actually wrong with you. Uh, we've retrained doctors to be family medicine specialists, so people will go to the same doctor, and maybe there's something that can be treated easily by that doctor, and you would only be referred to a specialist if it was necessary. And this system is uh, more effective in terms of health, and it's also uh, less expensive. We also, I notice we have a major uh, pharmaceutical company here today, so we also worked with pharmaceutical companies in the United States to supply uh, medicines, for example, insulin, uh, which otherwise people wouldn't be able to get in a place like Tajikistan. In terms of education, we worked a lot with teacher training to help the teachers understand that modern interactive teaching methodologies where the students do projects and ask questions are more effective than the rote memorization they will remember from their Soviet education. Uh, the second major goal was uh, mutual understanding. People usually think about this in terms of press relationships, and that is important. Relations with the media are key to achieving our goals overseas. We had robust engagement with the media in both countries, even though in Turkmenistan there really wasn't an independent media. I'm happy to say in Tajikistan that my team and I engaged the media in both Russian and Tajiki. I never really wrapped my brain around Turkmen, but fortunately my deputy was very good at it. We also trained journalists to be more objective and professional. For example, in, in the Soviet style of journalism, the, the fact and commentary is all sort of woven together, and we taught them that you need to have the fact and opinion separated so that people can make their own opinions. Mutual understanding covers a lot more than press relations, though. It includes the cultural, educational, and professional exchanges that build relationships that make the difficult conversations easier to have. And I'd like to give you a couple examples of those. Um, in Tajikistan, as we traveled around the country, we made an effort to get to know independent imams. We organized a trip for them um, under the International Visitors Program to come to the United States, to go to three towns, to stay with American families. They met local officials, federal officials, religious leaders, and they really got to see what freedom of religion means in the United States. And one of the big aha moments for them was actually in the State Department itself, and they saw some women in hijab, and they said, where are they visiting from? And they were told, they're not visitors. They are American employees of the Department of State. And that really was surprising to them. And I believe that they came back from that experience in America with a different opinion about America. And I think that some of what they learned continues to influence their sermons uh, at Friday prayers even today. 
Another example uh, in the mutual understanding field, maybe my favorite example, is the high school exchange programs. Every year we send 50 high school students from Turkmenistan and 50 from Tajikistan to the United States to live with American host families and go to public school. And it was amazing to me to see the difference in these young people from their pre-departure orientation to when they returned nine months later. When they came to us getting ready to go out, they would be um, timid, quiet, very brave. Uh, when they came back, they were loud, talkative, opinionated, <laughs> questioning everything, just like American teens. But in societies that never had any tradition of critical thinking or questioning authority, this was fairly revolutionary. And it's been exciting to me to see what some of these young people do. Uh, we had one that worked with us in the embassy for a while, and he went on at the ripe old age of 30 to become the CEO of the largest investment bank in Tajikistan. Another one, I don't know if any of you saw the recent PBS special recreating the ride of the Freedom Riders in the 60s. Um, they had 12 American co college students, and one of them was a Tajik alumni from our high school exchange program. So uh, mutual understanding is a very important goal, and in terms of that last one, I want to make a special pitch. I didn't actually put it in my notes, but uh, the problem that we're having with the high school exchanges is that we don't have enough host families. And this really is an opportunity not only for young people to have a transformative experience that's going to help them go back to their uh, own countries and develop those countries and overcome the authoritarian past. It's an opportunity for Americans to get to know about another country. So if any of you are interested or know anybody who is, I encourage you to look into it. It's a really rewarding experience. Well, not a traditional US uh, public diplomacy program, I'd like to say a word here about the Peace Corps. I was privileged to work with the Peace Corps in Turkmenistan. Our volunteers ranged in age from recent college graduates to one couple that celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in Ashgabat. They were stationed all over the country in isolated villages and towns. They lived in difficult conditions. They were frequently harassed by suspicious security authorities. They are really amazing people. They were teaching English and public health, and those are very important topics, but I think their impact was really much more than that. I think their real impact was the example that they set as Americans, and they might not have even realized that they were setting an example of uh, proactivity, of self-reliance, of a willingness to pull together coalitions to overcome obstacles, of dogged persistence, they really made a difference in every community where they worked, and I'm very proud of the work that they did, and I'm thrilled every time one of them joins the US Foreign Service. So, so far I've talked about three strategic goals and two supporting goals. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz. We wouldn't achieve any of those goals if we didn't have our sixth, which is a safe and secure diplomatic platform. That includes facilities management, human and financial resources, security, Essentially, what we're often doing is creating a first world diplomatic platform in a third world country. I'm a management foreign service officer by specialty. That's where I spent the first decade of my career. And I can tell you, sometimes it's hard work. In a place like Tajikistan, where you're at the end of everybody's supply line, where you don't have regular electricity for five months of the year, when the water is flowing, it might be brown or even lumpy. It can be a bit of a challenge, but we love a challenge. Finally, uh, the most important work we do at every embassy overseas, and that's consular work. Consular officers are playing an extremely important role in terms of protecting US national security through the visa function, keeping the bad guys out while letting in the people, the legitimate travelers who bring millions of dollars and jobs to the United States. But they're most important duty is the support of American citizens overseas. You may have seen in the news recently the evacuations of American citizens from Cairo and Libya, and those are sort of the big ticket items, but every day somewhere in the world when an American is in trouble, either with a law or a health issue, uh, there is an American consular officer rendering assistance. So who are the people that do these jobs? Who, who are your foreign service officers? They come from all over the United States, and they really do represent the diversity of America. 
We hire people up to the age of 60. So many of our uh, new foreign service officers are on their second or third careers. We have former military, business owners, elected officials, NGO leaders. Uh, I brought some flyers if any of you are interested <laughs> later on. Uh, when they join the Foreign Service, they come in in one of five main tracks or cones. They have to uh, select a cone when they even begin the application process, and those are consular, economic, management, political, and public diplomacy. They will work part of their careers in those cones and part of them in other jobs. Uh, over the course of a career, we want people to get a variety of experiences, which is included, in my case, a detail uh, to the National Security Council staff. It's a competitive process to get in, uh, which is really pretty amazing when you consider that. Well, sometimes people think about our, our, our embassies overseas, like Paris, London, Rome, and cocktail parties. The reality is two-thirds of our posts are hardship posts, and some of them are so dangerous that family members have to be left behind. But nonetheless, there are a lot of people interested in doing this job. The application process starts with a written exam, then it goes on to an all-day oral assessment. Those who pass the oral assessment go through security and medical clearances. Uh, this past year, just to give you a, an idea of the scale, we had over 22,000 people start with a written exam. By the time you get through the passers of the oral, we're down to less than 900. So those folks will go on a register, and we bring them into the Foreign Service as we have slots available. Last year was a banner hiring year. We brought in over 800 people. This was the second year of Secretary Clinton's Diplomacy 3.0 initiative, by which the goal was to increase the size of the Foreign Service by 25%. Uh, we got through year two, we got up to 17%, and now with the budget situation and, and fiscal 12, uh, that's all going to come to a grinding halt. But at least we do have that extra 17% which allows us to staff a growing number of positions in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. And it also allows us to create a small training float. What I mean by training float, in the military they have 25% uh, people more than they have positions because they understand that military folks are going to spend 25% of their careers in training. Since we have a much smaller service and a worldwide responsibility, uh, if somebody is in training at my institute, the Foreign Service Institute, chances are their job is sitting vacant. So, um, so that is the reason that we need to establish a training float. There's a statistic that often gets quoted that there are more members of U.S. military bands than there are Foreign Service officers. And this statistic is actually true. Um, don't get me wrong, I love the bands. There's nothing better that when you can get them to come and play at your 4th of July or at a Marine Ball. But I would also love to see a Foreign Service that's staffed and trained to do the complicated work it needs to do now and the work it needs to do in the future. The State Department is a lot more than its Foreign Service officers. We also have Foreign Service specialists, about 5,000 of those. They work in fields like uh, there are medical officers overseas, our IT folks, our um, human and financial resource managers. There are all kinds of specialties. We have our civil service colleagues who work at the Department of State and throughout the United States, for example, in passport offices. And then we have 40,000 locally engaged staff, our Foreign Service National colleagues overseas. And they really are the continuity and the cultural acuity of our embassies overseas. I wouldn't be worth my salt as the Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute if I didn't say a few words about training. The Foreign Service Institute trains 65,000 students a year from 47 different U.S. government agencies. We were established over 60 years ago principally as a language school. And the language school is still our biggest component today. We train folks in 70 different languages, in courses ranging from six months for an easier language like Spanish to two years for a more difficult one like Arabic. We have a School of Professional and Area Studies, which provides trade craft training in those areas that I mentioned, political, economic, consular management, public diplomacy, and also stability operations. We train all the civilians that are being deployed to work in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. We have a School of Applied Information Technology, which trains our IT professionals and also end users. And we have our newest school, created under Colin Powell, the Leadership in Management School. It was with Secretary Powell that we really 
started to understand that leaders have to be trained. They don't just sort of happen by magic. Finally, we have our transition center, which is an organization that helps not just the employees, but the family members prepare for and navigate our mobile lifestyle, with courses ranging from how to raise resilient foreign service children to how do you deal with the aftermath of service in a war zone when it's finally time to come home. I have to say I love my job at the Foreign Service Institute. It's great fun to have a chance to interact with everybody from our newest officers to our outgoing ambassadors. Uh, like many long in the tooth Foreign Service officers, I have a lot of stories to tell and it's great to be able to share them with the students and I'd be happy to share them with you as well during the question and answer period. Thank you very much for your kind attention. One of the uh, unique and fascinating highlights, Ambassador, of your remarks was learning that uh, Parade Magazine has a top ten list for worst dictators. But, uh, <laughs> and, and uniquely, as you finished your comments, uh, some of your points uh, coincided with the questions that we received. What advice would be beneficial for a young person who is preparing to take the Foreign Service Officer exam? The exam covers a variety of subjects, including U.S. foreign policy, foreign policy since World War II, uh, economics, American civics, culture, history of the United States, uh, and it includes uh, essays. So I would advise any, and not just young people, but everybody, to be uh, very well versed in all of those areas. Some people have advice like you should read uh, uh, three newspapers every day and make sure you read The Economist uh, every week. Uh, I didn't do any of that when I took the Foreign Service exam. I don't know how I passed. And when I look at the quality of the people coming in today, I'm so glad that I came in back then because I wouldn't make it today. Uh, the other piece of advice, if you have a young person in your life that's thinking about it, I'll leave, my, um, I'll leave my email address. I'm always happy to engage with people of all ages who are interested in the Foreign Service because uh, I've been doing it for 23 years. It was my 23rd anniversary in the Foreign Service this week, and I like to say I'm still having a hoof and good time. And I would like everybody to have as much fun as I'm having. <laughs> and, and uniquely, another question that was offered was, can you share a memorable, humorous story from your work in Foreign Service? I don't even know where to start with that one. <laughs> we, were, we were talking earlier about uh, strange food that you might be served in foreign locales and the fact that if you're going to be diplomatic, you know, you have to be diplomatic. And I was just sharing a story from 1991 uh, when I was nominated by my boss to go to Kazakhstan, which was then not even an independent country, to prepare for the visit of Secretary of State James Baker. Essentially what happened is my boss came in and said, who knows the capital of Kazakhstan? And I raised my hand and said, Alma Ata, father of apples. And he says, you have just won yourself a two-week trip. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly, I keep raising my hand, you know. So we went down there and uh, the Kazakhs like horse meat, you know. And they did serve us horse meat for our first meal, and I didn't eat it. I explained to our hosts that I would love to eat it, except I was a longtime vegetarian, which was actually true. Uh, we came to the official dinner later in the week, and the pièce de résistance came out, and it was a boiled sheep's head. And they started slicing bits of it off. Um, the security man got the ear because, you know, he's the ears of the State Department. Uh, they cut out the palate of the sheep. And there was this dangling piece of gristle, and they said, this goes to the youngest woman present to ensure a lovely singing voice. <laughs> and they were trying to hand it to me, but uh, one of my host government interlocutors remembered. He said, oh, no, she's a vegetarian. You have to give it to the next youngest woman president. So she glared at me. And um, <laughs> I still can't sing, but neither can she. So, so there you go. That's the story. Ambassador, what was the amount of the financial investment by the U.S. government in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan? Um, if we add up the foreign assistance that comes through USAID and also from the military, for the kinds of projects I described, uh, military exchanges as well, uh, in 
Tajikistan, it was running about $70 million because it's an extremely poor country. And if we want to build Tajikistan as a bulwark against the evils of trafficking in narcotics and persons, given its 1,000-kilometer border with Tajikistan, rather than a factor attracting those things, you know, we need to spend some money to do that. In Turkmenistan, it was significantly less. Our uh, assistance budget was about $4 million, and it didn't go to the government. It went to support NGOs, civil society, um, basic training for, for medical professionals. So th this is not assistance in Central Asia. I don't want anybody to have the idea that we're writing a check to these governments. We're using the funds to support the people and build capacity for those who want to build something better. That doesn't include embassy operating budgets, which I think in both cases, don't quote me, uh, probably about a million dollars uh, all in. And that reflects, in part, the enormous transit costs of getting people there and taking care of them once they're there. We won't quote you, we promise. Within the region you served, what kind of investments are available and or advisable? I think if you're talking about Turkmenistan, you have to think big picture issues. One of the big projects that we've been trying to develop for years, uh, it's not just a U.S. government project, it will require a big consortia of international financial institutions and private business, is uh, TAPI, the pipeline that could be built from Turkmenistan across Afghanistan and to Pakistan and India. You probably know that the markets of uh, South Asia are desperately hungry for energy. Such a pipeline would also help Afghanistan uh, regain its traditional role as, a, as an entrepot, as a transit location, and they could collect transit fees as well as get some energy themselves. And for Turkmenistan, it would help them diversify their energy sales. Right now what happens is they sell at the border, for example, to Russia, and uh, Russia charges almost twice as much for that gas when it sells it in Europe. And it uses the delta to keep gas prices low for its own population, which is an important political aim. Uh, but Turkmenistan could get more for its gas if there was more competition. Uh, obviously, such a project has a lot of questions. There's questions of security across Afghanistan. There's questions of protection of investment. Uh, but we're still working on this, and hopefully it'll go somewhere. Uh, another uh, project in Tajikistan that's under development is the CASA 1000. This is the creation of high-powered transit lines from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan uh, to Afghanistan and then on to South Asia. A uh, thousand kilowatt line which would be used to transit the energy surplus that those countries do have in the summertime. And already Tajikistan and Turkmenistan do sell some below market electricity to Afghanistan which helps in our efforts there. Uh, but there could be more done. So those are some of the sort of big picture ideas. Uh, smaller ideas, there are American businesses operating in Tajikistan. Um, at one point, the uh, most successful cell, cell phone provider was an American company. Uh, we also had an American company in uh, Turkmenistan, but uh, it's a difficult business environment in those kind of places. The rule of law is not developed to the place it needs to be to really ensure the kind of protection of investment that American investors want to see. What we did see a lot of success with American business in Turkmenistan was large-scale purchases from such companies that you know, like Caterpillar, John Deere, and Boeing. Turkmenistan was a very good customer of those companies. And commercial diplomacy is something that ambassadors are charged with working on everywhere in the world. And we do have a service in every embassy that provides market research and advice to business people that are looking to invest. Ambassador, what coordination takes place among ambassadors within a specific geographic area? Well, if it's a place like uh, Central Asia, it's a lot. Uh, we give each other advice, we share best practices, we give each other moral support when necessary. We're constantly in touch via the classified email. You don't call so much because the phone calls are monitored. And once or twice a year, we usually have a chief of mission conference. Uh, in, in my uh, time in Central Asia, when I was first serving in Turkmenistan, it was part of the European Bureau, uh, which had 55 different countries in it. So when we came back to Washington for a chief of mission conference, it was a huge thing. And when you think of countries that are stretching 
from uh, UK to Vladivostok and all the way down to Turkmenistan. I don't know, I don't feel like I probably got a lot of air time, but uh, we changed the structure of the State Department so that the countries of Central Asia became part of a new bureau called South and Central Asia, which only has 11 countries in it. And so those chiefs of mission conferences were a little bit smaller and gave us a little bit more time to really engage. And part of the reason that we made that switch wasn't so much for a workload within the State Department, but it was really we hoped that by combining um, our efforts in South Asia with Central Asia that we would figure out amongst ourselves how we could build greater synergies between those two regions. Uh, in terms of trade, in terms of democracy, you know, uh, the world's largest democracy isn't the United States, it's India. And that kind of example could be a relevant one for the Central Asians. So uh, one of the symbols of that new relationship between South and Central Asia that we were trying to build was a bridge that actually was funded by the U.S. military spanning the Pyonj River between uh, Tajikistan and Afghanistan to facilitate legal trade. And even as I left Tajikistan, I was there when that bridge opened and we were starting to see the trade increasing between the two regions. And if that grows, it will benefit both sides. What types of individuals receive diplomatic immunity? Okay, so this is a complicated legal question, uh, but the short answer is there's two diplomatic lists when you're overseas or when diplomats are here. There is full diplomatic immunity and then there is uh, consular or technical immunity. So it's different whether you're assigned to an embassy or a consulate. It's different whether you are uh, full diplomatic staff like a first secretary or an ambassador and uh, you might be a technical person, uh, for example, the IT person. Full diplomatic immunity is just what it sounds like. You can't be prosecuted in the country of assignment unless your government waives that immunity. And that has happened in the United States. I remember very well um, a few blocks from where I live uh, and this was long ago, there was a Georgian diplomat that killed a young woman named Jovian Waltrip while drunk driving. And the government of Georgia thought the relationship with the United States was important enough that they did waive his immunity and he spent some time in U.S. prison. With consular immunity or technical immunity, you are only immune for those acts that are directly connected with your job. In working with security cooperation, did you encounter and have the opportunity to overcome law enforcement corruption? Yeah, this is a, a real challenging issue. I mean, if you think about a border guard working on the Tajik border, making $3 a month, responsible for growing his own food, you know, how much do you really have to offer the guy for him to turn his head the other way? So we know the corruption existed. Uh, but what we tried to do was to create an environment where, for example, by building border facilities along that uh, long, rugged border with uh, sanitation, with water supply, and with some energy, either from a generator or increasingly we went to solar, uh, so that they could actually, during the desperately cold winters, stay in their border outpost, rather than just abandoning it to go and live someplace that was actually uh, minimally habitable. In terms of large-scale corruption, you know, if you can put your finger on it, you can raise it to the government. And, you know, we did that. When I had a carload of my diplomats who had a certain um, border officer, a senior one, demand a bribe, you know, we do go to the president and say, look, this guy did this on thus and such a, a date. Does something happen? Not always. Um, in fact, in a lot of places in the world, if you drive by a big house, somebody says, that must be a customs official. It's just a, it's a reality that we have to deal with, and this is part of the reason why we don't hand out money. Uh, instead, we provide training and capacity building so that at least we know that our funds are being used for their intended purposes. And when we do provide equipment, whether it's boots or um, generators or, or whatever it might be, we actually do go back and check. We go back the next year and count and demand that you know, we know how everything is being used. Most of the rest of the world is a lot more corrupt than the United States, at least uh, in, in my experience. And we, we talk about corruption here in America and corrupt politicians, and uh, we do not have a patch 
on some of the places that I have served where it's almost expected that if you're in a position of authority, then you will have the opportunity to uh, receive presents from people who you're in a position to help. And in fact, if you are a, a medical professional, for example, in one of these places, and you're not being paid a wage that you can live on or support your family with, it's expected that if you want access to medical care, you have to come with an envelope with a gift for the doctor. And that's just the way these countries work. We can try to overcome that. Certainly with our own assistance, we put safeguards in place so that it's not misused. But changing a mentality that's been in place maybe for centuries, that is the work of ages. And that is why I'm such a fan of the educational exchanges that we provide. Because people don't believe when we tell them this doesn't happen in America. They just don't believe it. Um, but when we have a, a 15 or 16 year old that comes here and sees that there's not a cop on every block demanding a bribe for you to pass. That if you want that A, you have to study for it. You can't just pay the teacher. And in fact, in some places, you can't get the A unless you've paid the teacher. So when they come and see that there is a different way of being, I think it really opens the mind. And I don't expect anybody to go back and create Jeffersonian democracy uh, in a place where it's not organically possible. But I do expect that these young people and other people that have been on exchanges who've seen something different will have a different kind of motivation and a different kind of capacity to work for a change. What programs for young people from the United States exist in the region? This is a great question, and it really changed when I was in Tajikistan. We didn't have much in Turkmenistan, and in Tajikistan we had had some Fulbright scholars coming through. But uh, it was actually uh, President Bush who started uh, a language initiative, and I'm going to forget the name of it, but it was like Languages for National Security or Critically Needed Languages. At any rate, what this did was provide U.S. government funding for uh, American young people to study abroad in, a, in an immersive kind of way to really learn some of these important and difficult languages like Korean and Arabic and Farsi. And since we can't send American students to Iran, uh, we send them to the next best place, Dushanbe, because Tajiki is a form of Persian, just like Farsi, just like Afghan Dari. In fact, it's about 85% intelligible. So we had uh, groups of young people coming every summer, uh, the last two summers I was in Tajikistan, to study Farsi um, as an immersion. And we increased our number of Fulbright scholars as well. And these are uh, great opportunities. And if anybody is interested in learning more about it, I will actually look up the name and get the website for you. And finally, Ambassador, we had a question. Is there a specific translation for the syllable stan in Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan? Well, stan or ston, it means a place or, uh, or a country. Um, like abat, you've heard of abat. Um, there's lots of abats in Pakistan, and I was uh, in Ashgabat, which roughly translates to the city of love. And that is where I met my partner, who was a British diplomat, so I do believe it was the city of love. But stan usually refers to a place. Well, Ambassador, uh, we know that you are going to try a horseshoe while you're here, but there's not enough time to try the many varieties of horseshoes that exist in the city of Springfield, so we hope you'll come back. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Tracy Ann Jacobson, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us with this edition of the Ambassador Series, and we hope that you'll tune in for future editions of the Ambassador Series in the future. Have a good evening. Good night.